Good morning, it's the 19th day of October today. Welcome to the Daily Post with some scriptures and thoughts and ideas that we hope will uh, uplift you and help you through the day. The scripture to begin is Proverbs 24 and verse 14. So shall the knowledge of wisdom be unto thy soul. When thou hast found it, then there shall be a reward, and thy expectation shall not be cut off. If you're reading the Bible any year today, you need to read Isaiah chapters 56, 57 and 58, and the second book of Thessalonians chapter 2. <coughs> Facts of the day. Throughout the Bible, when God asks a man to do something, methods, means, materials, and specific directions were always provided. The man had to do one thing, obey. And so it is. Each of us has a capacity for God and an ability to relate to him in a personal way. When we do, he brings to us pardon for the past, peace for the present, and promise for the future. Amen to that. Life is partly what we make it, and partly what is made by the friends we choose. The motivational thought for the day, never replace discipline with emotion and never replace mercy with discipline. On this day, in 1781, the American War of Independence came to an end when the British commander, Lord Cornwallis, surrendered his 8,000 troops to George Washington in Yorktown, Virginia, after a three-week siege. In 1860, on this day, the first company to manufacture internal combustion engines was formed in Florence, in Italy. The engines were designed by Eugenio Barsanti and Felice Matteucci. In 1872, on this day, the 630-pound Holterman Nugget, the largest gold-bearing nugget ever found, was mined at Hill End in New South Wales, Australia. And in 1943, on this day, very important, streptomycin was discovered. This miracle antibiotic became the first line of offence against tuberculosis in the mid-20th century, and it was isolated for the first time by graduate student Albert Schatz on this day. Black Monday. Millions of dollars are wiped off the value of shares on Wall Street and other financial markets around the world. On this day in 1987, Wall Street ended the day down 22% lower than the Wall Street crash of 1929. And in 2014, a working human intestine was generated in the laboratory from stem cells in the United States on this day. The personal story of the day, deeds are greater than words. The scripture from 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1 with references from Matthew chapter 7 verses 15 to 20. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. William Grimshaw, a contemporary of John Wesley, once spoke with a woman who told him how much she admired a certain preacher. The man had plenty of talent as a speaker, but little evidence of grace in his life. Madam, Grimshaw told the woman, I am glad you never saw the devil. He has greater talents than all the ministers in the world. I fear if you saw him, you'd fall in love with him as you have so high a regard for talents without sanctity. Pray, do not be led away with the sound of talents. Although it was spoken more than two centuries ago, Grimshaw's warning feels uncomfortably contemporary. In this media-saturated age, it is easy for us to have more regard for talents than sanctity. Sadly, the last few decades are littered with ruins from the ministries of men and women who had a great following because of their speaking ability or personality, 
but who had failed in the area of holiness and truth. In the above scripture, Jesus warns us to be wary of those who have speaking ability, but no godly character. Outwardly, they seem to speak the words of Christ. They appear to be people we should listen to and benefit from. In reality, they are spiritually dangerous. Like wolves disguised as sheep, they are intent only on gratifying themselves at the expense of God's flock. The scenario Jesus described poses a practical problem for the believer. Since these false prophets look like sheep, how do we recognize them? Jesus outlines the basic test of fruit. In Deuteronomy chapter 13 and verse 13, God's people were warned not to follow a prophet who contradicts God's word, even if he has performed a sign or a wonder. God's primary test for those who claim to speak on his behalf is the test of truth. It is what they say, not how they say it, that is most important. In addition, Jesus indicates that we should submit those who claim to speak to God to the test of character. It is not unreasonable to expect those who proclaim God's word to practice what they preach. What standard do you use when you evaluate those who claim to speak for God? Are you more interested in style than in content? Are you willing to overlook significant character flaws because you are impressed with their personality or speaking ability? God expects us to test all that we hear. The content validates the message and character authenticates the messenger. This is also true for us when our actions fail to reflect the truth of the gospel we preach a watching world naturally questions the validity of the message. The devotional thoughts of the day, when only the humble will do. Not only was the Son of God born in an unlikely location and of unlikely parents, he chose his first followers at an unlikely place. He didn't search the religious schools for the most learned scholars. He didn't look among the ranks of brilliant, brilliant military leaders. He stayed away from skilled statesmen and famous orators. Rather, Jesus went to the shores of Galilee and called out four common fishermen, Peter and Andrew, James and John. Bad choice, some might say. Uneducated, tough characters. What would they know about starting a worldwide movement? They couldn't work a crowd if they had to. Hmm. Now on behalf of fishermen everywhere, let me say that they have many positive traits. They must be resourceful, courageous and patient. They must plan carefully and take care of their equipment. Such qualities are no doubt helpful in carrying out the Great Commission, which we read in Matthew 28 verses 19 and 20. But I don't think that's why Jesus chose those men. I believe he wanted to demonstrate how God can transform ordinary people into, quote, fishes of men, unquote, as we read in Mark 1, 16 and 17. God's work is often done by unlikely people from unlikely places. People like you and me. To be successful, we must follow the one who can make us fishers of men. The second thought is entitled, Born Again. The scripture is from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and verses 4 and 5. And you hath he quickened, who are dead in trespasses and sins. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in our sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. When the Spirit of God moves into a person's heart, their body and soul, that person is born again. We, who were dead in sin, are revived by God. Of course, we were not dead physically, and our soul was not dead, but our spirit was. We were separated from fellowship with God. Anything we did was affected by our inner darkness 
and our rebellion against God. In seductive madness, the world proclaims that all people are good deep within. In religious heresy, people claim that we all have an inner light that we simply need to locate with the help of certain exercises. But no one can find anything good deep within. We can be trained to do great social deeds. We can be raised to have high moral values, to be self-disciplined and to be highly cultured. But we cannot remove the root of selfishness, of sin, from our inner man. <clears throat> God knew this and he provided a solution. The solution is to die from the spiritually dead old man who has no contact with God. We die to our world through water baptism and Holy Spirit baptism. In a flash, two things take place. We die and we are born again. God's Spirit creates a new person in us. We receive a new heart. We become new creatures in Christ. God's Spirit comes to live in us and we become His children with access to His power. Now we are in God's family. Now we are grafted into the body of Christ. Now we enjoy citizenship with all the saints. Now we are believers. We have been born from darkness to light. We are born again from above. Now we have a true purpose in our lives. Thoughts in verse today. Number 685, Amazing Grace, my chains are gone. This is a variation on Amazing Grace and I think the words are particularly sensitive. Some of it is in fact Amazing Grace words. There are four verses and the chorus and we'll look at two verses today and the chorus. The first verse says, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost but now I'm found was blind but now I see. Second verse says, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed." And the chorus which is sung after each verse, "'My chains are gone, I have been set free. My God, my Saviour has ransomed me, and like a flood his mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. And it truly is amazing. The words are wonderful. Um, they help us to remind ourselves each day of God's amazing grace. The facts of the day. Chewing gum while peeling onions will keep you from crying. Cats have 32 muscles in each year and the challenge for you for today is to work that into a conversation somehow. <laughs> the closing thought, Lord, slow me down. Give me time to enjoy my walk, time to spend with my family and friends, time to meditate on our relationship and time to fellowship. Amen to that. Thank you for joining us this morning. We hope that uh, the Daily Post has been helpful and beneficial to you and we hope that you'll join us again tomorrow. We hope that you have a blessed day and bye for now.